if you guys could do me a favor, just indulge me for just a minute here. And would you hold your hand up in front of you? And put your other one over it so it's creating a little space between them. Now take a look through there. Or if you don't want to do it that way, just take your fist and do this. Close the other eye and look through it. Now imagine this is all you can see. And right this minute, you have to get up and you need to leave this room right now. Could you do it? Well, I have to do it every day. Hi, my name's Jackie Ponis, and I'm legally blind. Now, many people regard blindness as the inability to see anything at all. Now, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of stats, but the World Health Organization says that the, uh, there are 285 million blind people in the world. That's a lot. Um, of that, 39 million of them are totally blind. Now, for those of you without a calculator, I can tell you that there's, that's about 14% of all the blind people in the world are totally blind. That leaves the other 86% to be people like me who fall into the legally blind category. So, I have about eight degrees of visual field. Um, legally blindness, legal blindness is, is, is uh, defined as being able to see 2200 with your corrective lenses or to have a 20, less than 20 degree visual field. Now most of you have between 180 and 220 degrees of visual field. Now, this is about 180 degrees, this is 90, 45, Approximately 20, if I'm doing okay here, which is the definition of legal blindness, and this is about 10. I fall into this 10 degree, 10 degree perception range. Now, there are very many different kinds of eye problems that can cause blindness. I'm only going to touch on a couple of them because there's just far too many. You probably have heard of some of them and probably even know someone who has them. The photos I'll be showing you here today give you an idea of what it actually looks like for someone, to, for someone to see with these problems. The first one I'm going to tell you about is cataracts. Now people with cataracts experience cloudy vision, faded colors, and halos around lights. Cataracts are common to older people, and they can be treated with surgery. If left untreated, they can lead to blindness. Now before I had cataract surgery, I could, would describe my vision as looking through the bottom of a shot glass. Now the next picture that I have here is the day that my husband and I both had cataract surgery. You know they say that family that plays together stays together? Well, I'm gonna, does this count? Um, the next one I want to tell you about is diabetic retinopathy. And as you can tell by its name, it's common to people with diabetes. These people experience cloudy vision, darker distorted images. Sometimes they have spots or st web-like strings in their vision. I had a friend that had diabetic retinopathy and he said that his vision was like looking up from the bottom of a swimming pool. His problem was one that couldn't be helped with glasses. Now the next one I'm going to tell you about is glaucoma. In its early stages, glaucoma has no symptoms at all. It, eventually, a person can develop blind spots, blurred vision, and have rainbows or, or halos. And eventually their, vision, their visual field can be reduced to something that's called tunnel vision. Well, I'm currently being treated for glaucoma. The last one that I'm going to share with you is retinitis pigmentosa. This one is the most important to me. It's also referred to as RP. One in 4,000 people have RP, and I'm one of them. I was diagnosed with this about 28 years ago, and I went to the eye doctor because I had a dark spot down here by my nose. Um, the next picture that I'm going to show you here is a picture of a pair of glasses that I made for my grandkids so that they could experience what I could see. Retinitis pigmentosa is a slow loss of vision, and it's different in every patient. When I was diagnosed, I was told that I would be blind, completely blind in five years. Fortunately for me, that didn't happen. RP patients also experience decreased night vision, difficulty adjusting to darkness, and eventually RP patients also lose their visual field, such as glaucoma patients, 
Um, and in some cases, they lose their visual acuity as well. Now, people often ask me, well, how do you see? Is it dark? Well, I'm lucky because my visual acuity is still good, and what I see, I see well. But I can tell you that the edges of my vision are cloudy or like looking through a screen door. Then after that, there's nothing at all. It's kind of like if I was to say, what does your vision look like back here? It's just plain not there. Um, the truly confusing part about having RP is that um, the brain interprets what it thinks you're supposed to see and makes the image, creates the image that it thinks you're supposed to see. Too upset. As an example, if I hold my hand up like this, I can't see it at all. But my brain is telling me, rather than putting a blank spot, I know that there's a railing there and, and carpet, and so that's what it's providing me. It's, whoops. Thanks, Tulip. <laughs> that's what Janice was afraid of happening. Once I was diagnosed with RP, I started researching it. Oh, and the, the worst part about having RP is that there's no cure. Once I was diagnosed, diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, I started researching it, and I discovered that I even had parts of it, um, symptoms of it, whenever I was a teenager. Did we just lose sound? No. Oh, okay. Um, I, had a lot of diff I had had a lot of difficulty seeing at night. And when I was out with friends, somebody would say, did you see that? And I'd go, you can see that? I can't. You know, but I thought everybody could see the way I did. Then driving at night was really difficult for me because I would see images that weren't there, like elephants or buildings or people in the street. So I never, I didn't drive at night for forever, excuse me. Um, but none of that made any sense to me as a teenager until I finally was diagnosed with RP. Now I can see very little, if anything, after dusk. And I hate when time changes in the fall because I take it personally that they take that hour of sunlight away from me every single day. Actually, most of my friends and neighbors have a hard time understanding my challenges. They'll say to me, but you're making eye contact with me. Well, you can tell from our little demonstration here that I can still make eye contact. Or, you manage so well. Well, since I've had this for 28 years, I have had plenty of time to practice in the managing it so well department. <laughs> when you have RP or any of the other problems that I mentioned, you learn to adjust. I heard somebody say recently that blindness is just another way of seeing, and I agree with that. Visually impaired people have figured out how to make it work. One of the early things I learned to do was scan. Um, I literally take my eyes and I look back and forth and back and forth and back and forth as fast as I can to see as much as I can in the shortest amount of time and then set that to memory. The bad part about using that is that things can happen, change very rapidly. For instance, I hate the airport because I'll be scanning back and forth and sure enough, somebody just set a bag right in my path and pow. Um, I believe another way of seeing is by using your other senses. As you can imagine, everyone uses their hearing, well, except for deaf people, everybody uses their hearing to see. You hear the sirens, you, you hear the walk and don't walk sign, you hear a skateboard, you hear a, a bouncing ball, you're aware of something that's about to happen and you use that to help you see. We also use smells. Um, when a visually imper impaired person is out um, walking, they may take a, a fragrance cue from a bakery or a coffee shop or a tire shop, you know, those places that have distinct um, aromas. I was at a local high school recently and I knew ex where I, that I was exactly where I was supposed to be because of the eucalyptus trees next to the football field. And of course, visually impaired people are recognized for their use of the long cane. And the cane is used for exactly what you think it is. It finds obstacles, it finds sidewalks, it finds curbs, and it can even find the middle of the street. Now, have you ever noticed that whenever it's raining that the water doesn't go down the middle of the street, it goes down the gutters? 
Well, that's because the streets aren't. And the blind people know that, and they can get up there, and then as soon as they get to the center of the street, they're pretty much aware of how far it is now to the opposite curb. It also, obviously, will find the depth and the, the, the height and the depths of the stairs or the curbs that you're about to step off on. Now, in addition to our senses, some of us are lucky enough to have a guide dog. Huh. Um, <laughs> these incredible animals are gifted friends and helpers. I'm so happy that my dog owns me. While in training, we were taught to find the curb, to find a chair, or to follow the shoulder of the, of the street. Until I got home from training, I never imagined just how much she would add to my life and well-being. Two weeks after we returned from training, I was in a local 5K. And at the end of the walk, I wasn't sure. I mean, it wasn't so much that I was confused, but I was tired, and I couldn't find my husband, and I wasn't lost. I just So I told her, find Daddy. And she parted the crowd and walked right to his side. And she's done this in hotels and in restaurants and shopping malls, and she'll even find the car in the parking lot. If It doesn't matter which car we go in, she'll find that car in the parking lot. Is she perfect? No. <laughs> but she sure tries to be. We were, in, we were recently in Las Vegas for a wedding, and I told her to find two of my grandchildren, and off she went. And I wasn't surprised when she took me to a restaurant because we were meeting them for breakfast. But we got to the restaurant, and I scanned, and I didn't see him. So I asked my husband, do you see them? And he goes, nope, they're not here. So I turned around, told her to go forward, find the kids. And she walked over, and she just found them in a minute. I turned to my family and says, well, that was really weird. She didn't, um, she took us over to that other restaurant. And they said, well, we were just over there, but the restaurant was closed. So she did her job, eventually. I was so proud of her. I've been trying to think of the things that I cannot do, and it's been hard because I believe I can do anything I want. Well, with the exception of driving, because the state of California would frown on it. <laughs> I have a friend of mine that told me that people don't understand how she can be blind and do crafts. Well, I com can completely relate to this because I started my own embroidery business 13 years ago. What's it called? The Blind Stitch. What else would you call a store that was owned by a visually impaired seamstress? <laughs> now, blind and visually impaired people are successful in all walks of life. Did you know that Joseph Pulitzer ran his newspaper empire from while being blind? Former Ma uh, San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown has RP. And so does Steve Wynn, the owner of the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas. I also have friends that are artists, poets, they create jewelry, they crochet, and they knit. Blind people can do anything that anyone else can do. We also have challenges. While I described to you what 10 degrees of vision looked like, I didn't tell you that that also includes up and down. So what are some of the things that really bother me there? Well, open dishwashers, overhanging tree limbs, um, open cabinet doors. They're just a hazard. Also, have you ever been to the grocery store and you come across this box that's of produce or something, and then you step to the side only to get hit in the head with a hanging basket? I have. And I have a really difficult time in low light. Romantic restaurants are not for me. <laughs> Neither are movie theaters. Um, I recently went to the movies with a dear friend of mine who um, we walked into the, you know, into, opened the door, walked into the theater, and she just bebops down the, down the hallway, and I just stopped. And I said, come on, get me. And she went, oh, I forgot. And she come back, and I don't think she's forgotten me since. <laughs> Other challenges are actually related to people. I was at the eye, doctor of, uh, eye doctor's office recently, of all places, and the woman's handing me my insurance card while I'm filling out paperwork. Well, my husband goes, she can't see that. And that's my cue to look up and say, what is it that I didn't see? So. Also, in addition to that, shaking hands and a high five are totally outside of my recognizable world. I've been accused of being stuck up on way lots of occasions for missing a high five. So what else can't I do? Well, I can thread a needle, but I can't, you don't want me on your volleyball team. I can work my computer, but I'm not going to drive you anywhere. I own my own business, 
I can shop for groceries, I can use public transportation, but it just might not be able to figure out if that faucet in the restroom is automatic or not. And I might not be able to find dryer or the paper towels. When I learned that I was going to be here speaking here today, I contacted some of my visually impaired friends and asked them what, what they'd like for me to tell you. Now one of the things is please interact with us, speak directly to us. The person next to us isn't going to answer my questions for me. And please don't yell. We can hear just fine. <laughs> Yelling does not help me see better. Please be thorough when you give directions. If you can say, um, that store is four blocks east, that's to your right, and you have to pass the donut shop to get there. That gives us a distance cue, a touch cue for the cane or the dog, as well as a, a, an aroma so that we'd know when we got to the right place. Or like in the bathroom ex e e um, example, tell me to raise my hands and it'll come on. It's not helpful just to point or say, it's over there. We don't know where there is. When opening a door, please say, I have that door for you. Then we know that the door's open, we know that you're holding it, and it's safe for us to go through. And if we need assistance, please allow us to take your arm. Taking my arm doesn't help me. In fact, it's frightening. Taking my arm, taking your arm allows me to understand where you're moving, the, the change in terrain, and while you're taking my arm and pulling me, it's just scary. If you're in my home or office, please put things back where they were, because I waste so much time trying to figure out where that pair of scissors was that wasn't there before. Um, and last but certainly not least, for those of us, for those of us that have guide dogs, we know you love our dogs. Who wouldn't? Um, <laughs> but while they're in harness, they're working. They should be ignored always. Please speak to the handler, not to the dog. Don't make eye contact with the dog. And above all, don't feed or pet the dog. These rules are in effect because it, it's to maintain our team bond and to allow any distractions. I mean, those things could cause a distraction that would put us in harm's way. And it's really important for, ever, for both of our safety. Now, I want to thank you very much for your time and attention to allow me to, to show you how I and millions of others see the world.